I want you to imagine a time before the internet. A time when everybody wasn't instantly connected to a mass of strangers, when there was no constant community. A time when the connection wasn't as close as the phone in your pocket, when most people went their whole lives only ever having sequential face-to-face -face interactions. If you're a Gen Z or younger millennial, it's been this way for your whole life, but even us older 90s kids might have forgotten the pre-internet era. Now, take a step further back to a time before computers were ubiquitous, when everybody didn't have one, when most people went their whole lives without running into anything more complicated than a cash register. You might not even know anybody who'd seen one. If you were in a few industries, you might deal with one at work, or maybe you went to a university that had one, but even then, unless you were a computer science major, you might not even know where the computer lab was. And if you did, well, there were only one or two computers, and everybody shared a terminal. You might even connect over the phone line to a bigger university's computer. Everybody shared the resources of a machine that was way less powerful than the phone in your pocket back here in 2021. I'm telling you this, I'm setting the stage so you know what I mean when I say that Bob Albrecht was a computer evangelical. Back in the early 70s, computers were a vague and complicated concept to most people, and the very idea that you might want to be familiar with them was foreign. But Bob? Bob was different. Bob had vision. He could see that potential computers had to change people's lives. Bob had dropped out of school in the 50s to take a job with the Minneapolis Honeywell Aeronautical Division developing flight control systems for high-speed aircraft using analog engineering techniques. He was one of the first engineers to use the company's new IBM 650 and got his start trying to convince the other engineers that, hey, maybe they should too. In the 60s, he was working for Data Corporation as a senior applications analyst and was asked to give a talk at George Washington High School in Denver. Student response to his talk on computers was tremendous, prompting him to dedicate the better part of the rest of his life to getting young people involved with computers. Early exposure, he felt, was key. The best way to do that, Bob reasoned, was to show them that they could make games using the new basic programming language. His first step was to form a publishing imprint, Dimax, to publish a book titled My Computer Likes Me When I Speak Basic for computer manufacturer DEC. He was compensated not with royalties, but with one of DEC's own PDP-8 minicomputers. Old Bob took that computer, loaded it up into an old VW bus, and took it from school to school, teaching kids how to make games. Dimax itself was headquartered in an old Menlo Park storefront, where they'd let people come in and code and learn. Bob's approach to popularizing computers was very collective, people power, hippie. In 1972, Bob launched a zine to chronicle the movement he'd started, calling it the People's Computer Company, a name inspired by Janis Joplin's band, Big Brother and the Holding Company. The first issue had the following counterculture message on the cover. Computers are mostly used against people instead of for people, used to control people instead of to free them. Time to change all that. We need a people's computer company. The PCC covered developments in computer evangelism and included code in BASIC for enterprising programmers to copy and learn from. It also contained hardware buying suggestions. Remember, this was well before any mass-produced home computers. If you wanted one at home, you'd have to build a homebrew rig from scratch or a mail-order kit. The zine was successful enough to spin off into a non-profit, also called the People's Computer Company, offering classes in ad hoc computing at 50 cents an hour for anyone who wanted to stop by that Menlo Park storefront. Inside, they'd set up their PDP-8 mini-computer with multiple terminals, as well as a dedicated phone line connected to a computer at Hewlett Packard, who donated some free cycles to the PCC. This is a series on game history, not computer history, so let's focus in on that element. The freewheeling coder community growing up around the PCC shared and modified code in BASIC, much of it for games, creating projects that mutated and grew through the many hands that typed them. These games included Mugwump, in which users try to find a hidden mugwump in a 10x10 grid. Chomp, where players take turns biting from a cookie, last bite loses. 
Bagels and Beyond Bagels, mastermind-style games where you have to figure out secret codes, make a guess, and you're told how many digits are right. Hunt the Wumpus, where the player travels a cave system hunting the legendary Wumpus. In any given cave, there are three exits, and you're given clues if those exits contain bottomless pits, the Wumpus, or super bats. Star Trader, a mercantile space sim in a 10x10 grid. They also made versions of the mainframe games we talked about in our second video, like the enhanced versions of the Sumerian game and Star Trek. None of these games were copywritten. The PCC was very much against copyright in an era where a young Bill Gates was publishing editorial letters to the people pirating his version of BASIC, and many of them ended up in later collections of BASIC games, and during the home computer era would be rewritten and discovered by the developers who would go on to become the big industry names in the 80s and 90s. Perhaps the most enduring legacy of the People's Computer Company was the common cultural game-developed language that these games helped create, and it all started in the back of a hippie's VW bus.